Hey everyone, welcome back to part two of episode three. We are doing a, a full playthrough of scenario uh, one in Wing Leader's Victory, second edition, Tiger Tiger. And in the last episode, we uh, got through the first three turns, I should say, uh, yeah, the first three turns of uh, the scenario. And we are in turn four. We've resolved our first combat, um, and we ended the last video uh, about to resolve uh, the second combat in the. And uh, the result of the first combat was pretty bad for the Chinese. They failed to score any hits and were hit themselves, but no damage was inflicted. But worst of all, they were broken, and so. Uh, they failed their cohesion roll, and now they are out of the fight. So we still have two um, good order German bomb, uh, Japanese bomber squadrons that are going to uh, score some victory points for the Japanese. And uh, if they can make it to column H and drop their bombs, and so things are not looking good for the Chinese at this point. So let's go ahead and jump right back in and let's resolve uh, this combat. Now we did something interesting with this combat, which is worth repeating again. We are going to um, use the bounce rules. I know these are in the advanced rules of Wing Leader, but to me they kind of seem like a basic rule. Um, and I like adding it very early um, in these early scenarios. And bounce is a way for your fighters to have an advantage over their tallied target uh, attacking them and it can happen in multiple ways with bombers the only way that you can bounce uh, or another term for that is attacking out of the sun the only way that you can bounce them is if you spend two movement points in the bombers sun arc immediately before entering their square. So with B, I'll just kind of reiterate what would happen earlier, and I can't remember exactly where he moved from, but he was higher. Um, he had uh, three movement points, but since he's going to be diving um, on the Japanese bomber, he gets to claim a uh, fourth movement point, a bonus one movement point to his movement. So he essentially moved something like one, two, now this this square is in the bomber's sun arc, and you remember from looking at this chart on the back of the rule book, the, the sun arc is right upper as defined by the scenario. So these two squares uh, are in the sun for the bomber, so these two squares. So this was one movement point spent in the sun. And then when he moves here, this is a second movement point spent in the sun. And the, it starts counting when you move into a square, that's a one movement point spent in that square. So he by moving from here to here, that's one movement point. And then here to here, that's two movement points in the sun. So he spent the required two movement points in the sun and now he has to enter the uh, the Japanese bomber square from a square in the sun. So he spends his last movement point um, to fly down here. Which, if he if he had an extra movement point, he has to stop because he he entered his tally target square. So I'm marking him with die. So that's kind of how we left off. We are now, uh, and it's important to note if you cannot leave. Uh, a square that's in the sun and then and then drop from here to here that's not a bounce because the square is not in the sun you have to enter from a square in the sun and spend two movement points in the sun so if he started here for example he could have spent two movement points just circling here and then his third and fourth movement point to dive down and that would qualify for bounce as well and don't forget it's very important when you're moving um, you are allowed to uh, unless the rules say otherwise for specific mission types, but you're allowed to um, use up uh, unused movement points 
uh, circling in a square along the way. Um, and it's particularly important for getting that bounce advantage is to spend extra movement points in the sun so that you can bounce the bombers. Okay, so let's go ahead and resolve this combat. So, again, first we determine who the attacker is. The attacker, uh, in this case, we have we have bombers on one side, so that side is always the defender. And in general, the, the last unit to move in is going to be the attacker side. But because there's bombers involved, the Chinese fighter flight is the attacker. So they get to choose speed or turn. We're at altitude 9, so we're in this band. He's going to choose speed, because remember, we don't like that nasty uh, turn modifier that the bombers get. Uh, they're plus 2 to their defense rating. So they're going to roll... I mean, their speed's a five. Um, they're diving, so that's plus one to their speed. So they get plus six. I'm gonna go ahead and get the chart here so you can follow along. So that's what this is right here. Uh, plus one, they're marked with a dive marker. Um, but they are a flight, so that's minus one. Um, so that's, they're a, a five modified up to a six and back down to a five for being a flight. The bombers have a speed of three, and then they are marked with bombs on their wing display. And per this one right here, they're marked with a bomb load that's minus one to their speed or turn rating. So their speed goes down to a two. So we're looking at a five versus two. That's plus three for the Americans. That's minus three for the bombers. And from the last combat, this was a plus two minus two combat because the fighters were not diving. They flew in level and they didn't have the speed advantage from the dive. Uh, so their speed was actually a five modified down to a four because they're a flight and they didn't have the dive advantage to, to counter that flight status. But these guys are diving so they have better odds, plus three, minus three. So let's go ahead and we're gonna roll for the Americans again. The order in which you resolve these combat rolls is not important because the combat is simultaneous. So let's roll for the Americans. And that's a better roll. That is a better roll. Alright, so we got a 7. Now if we look down here, we have uh, the attacker bounces the defender. And that's what we did wait by entering from the sun arc, spending two movement points in the sun, we get to bounce. So we get plus one to the roll. So this becomes, this becomes an 8. And those are all the modifiers that apply. So eight on the plus three column, that is two hits. So we're going to resolve two hits against the bombers. Let's go ahead and just take care of those now. And we use this uh, losses chart. So we're going to roll one dice for each hit. We're gonna add the combatant's firepower of one to each of these rolls. And then we're gonna compare that to their protection rating. So we gotta get higher than a five uh, to kill this bomber. If we roll a uh, modified 4 or 5, it's going to be a straggler. Anything less than that is no effect. So here we go. Here's the first hit. And that's an automatic no effect. So not good. Let's roll again. And that's better. A 6 is an automatic kill. Even if modifiers uh, were involved or if, it, if their defense protection rating was a 6, this is just an automatic kill. So we'll go ahead and we'll mark that bomber, let's see, that's bomber W, so we're gonna mark him with a loss. Now let's roll the combat, uh, roll for the Japanese. They're gonna roll on the minus three column, so here it goes. And they also roll a seven, but because they were bounced, attacker bounces defender, they get a minus one to their roll. So that goes down to a six, and we look on this chart, no hits. All right. So now next we gotta do cohesion. We gotta see if our fighters stick together to fight another turn. So here goes their cohesion roll, and that looks good. That's eleven, and they're gonna get plus one because they are because they are the attacker. They're on the attacking side, so plus one. So that goes up to a twelve. So they pass, but they do get marked with a minus one ammo marker. So their next cohesion roll will get a minus one to it. Let's roll for the bombers. Now this is 
hopefully going to cause some disruption. We really need to disrupt these guys. So let's roll there. The bomber cohesion. That is what we wanted. That is what we wanted. So that's a four. And on the cohesion table, the bombers use this column right here. So total losses. Well, they just got one, so that is minus one. And so that goes down to a three, and that's all the modifiers that apply. So on a three, we do score one level of disruption. Now you notice that for fighters, it's possible for them to score two levels of disruption in cohesion hits on themselves like, and after combat. They can break, a squadron can break if they roll a three or less. Bombers can't, they're, they're always going to disrupt first and then in a later combat they can break. So bombers, they stuck together better and it's kind of easy to understand. The bombers flew in formations they weren't maneuvering like fighters, so it was easier for them to stay uh, in that formation. So it was a slonger, slower, harder process to break them up. So one level of disruption for the bombers. That is what we needed. All right. Get the Chinese back in the game here. All right. So that is the end of combat. Um, so we've finished the combat phase, we go to the administration phase, there's nothing really to do here. Oh, we did forget to remove this tally marker. Because C broke after its combat, it loses its tally. Okay. So let's go ahead now and advance to turn five. And let's begin with the tally phase. Now we're not going to change our tally. Um, B wants to keep, well, let me think. Column H, oh, we're already reaching column H. Yeah, I think it's best just for B to keep his tally as is. It's important to note, because he's in the same square with an unbroken enemy squadron, um, he cannot, he can drop his tally, but he would not be able to tally another squadron outside of his square because he is in a square with an unbroken enemy. So if he drops his tally, all he's going to be able to do is try to tally this bomber again. So let's just keep the tally on there. There's no point in removing it. All right, so here goes movement. So we're right at column H. So this bomber is going to sp spend one movement point. He's at column H, so he drops his bombs. So let's just get rid of this bomb marker. We'll just stick it down here for now. And then for his second movement point, he's going to turn 180 degrees like this. Remember, a, a facing change of 180 degrees does cost one movement point. So he went one and then turned around for two. And that's going to trigger this guy's movement. Um, so let's go ahead and move him now before we move this bomber. We'll keep this tally marker with him. Now, I am not just going to run in an attack again. I'm actually going to have B climb up because we need to set ourselves up for another diving attack. Um, you got you to realize that with flights are very fragile, as we saw with these guys. They're likely only to get one or two combats, so you want to make those combats count uh, before the cohesion rolls send them home. So uh, try to set up the best combat situations and use your flights and squadrons as very precious resources. Use them when you really need to and when the situations are best, but don't just throw them in the combats needlessly because your cohesion rolls are going to send them packing and they won't do as much effect. So we're going to have B, rather than follow after W, they're going to climb. Um, let's see, we're at altitude 9, so this is going to cost two movement points at altitude 9 to climb one, so he's going to change facing. And we'll just rotate up like this. Now that's not 180 degrees, so that's a free rotation. And then he's going to fly straight up, come on, straight up for two movement points. He's got one more movement point. We'll just go ahead and have him circle here. Uh, actually, no, we'll have him rotate to face this square for free and then fly here. So one, two, three. Now, why didn't I just go from here? Well, yeah, it's the same thing, essentially, because it costs one movement point to rotate 180 degrees and then fly up for two more movement points. So whatever, that's fine. We'll flip this to the climb side. Um, this squadron is going to fly one, two, and he's going to drop his bombs, so I'll take those off the wing display. 
And then C, he's broken, so he's going to fly home. And there's no point in actually flying him home. He can just be removed because there's nobody that can engage him again, so we're just going to take him off and put him on his wing display. Cleans up the board a little bit. All right, that's the end of that turn. There's no combat. So we go to turn six. So here we go, turn six. Let's go to the tally phase again. We're going to keep the tallies as they are. We're going to go ahead and harass these bombers as best we can and try to get as many losses as possible. There's no advantage to attacking this guy now because he's already dropped his bombs, he's gotten his points um, from doing so. The only thing we can get points from is by killing bombers. So this guy's disrupted, that's going to help us in combat and give us better odds. So we're going to work on this guy and try to take some more bombers down. So here we go, movement phase. Bombers move first, so we'll move this guy, one, two. That triggers B's movement. He has a tally on B. So we're going to we're going to set up another bounce. And we're going to do it from head-on. I'm going to show you what a head-on combat looks like. So we're going to go uh, rotate down one movement point, and this is in the sun. Remember the sun arc for this guy kind of goes like this. So one movement point in his sun arc. We're going to spend a second movement point just circling. So we'll just change our facing like this. Then for our third movement point, we will fly down into his square, like so, and mark him with a dive marker. Now I am entering from head on, so even though I've got, I've spent, I've entered my tally target square, when you enter from head on, you actually can use additional movement points to move back out of the square, only in head on combat situations. And that can be useful when you want to exit and re-enter from behind to avoid a that minus two head-on combat modifier. But we want to attack from head-on, and I'll show you why. We'll see if we can't hit these vulnerable bombers from head-on. All right, then this guy's going to turn for 180 degrees for one movement point, and then fly here. All right, so we have another bounce. Let's go ahead and resolve this combat. So again, it's going to be the exact same situation here. I have a speed of 5, plus 1, because they're diving, minus 1, because they're flight. So they have a 5. The Japanese, let me go ahead and just put this up here so we can see. The Japanese have a speed of 3. They no longer have the bombs. They dropped those, so they're just a 3 now, but they're disrupted. So minus 1 to their speed, they're now a 2. And it's important to note we have to use speed combat in this situation because we are entering, we have a head-on combat situation. These three squares are ahead of this bomber. They're the, the forward three squares. So if I enter from one of these three squares, it is a head-on combat situation or a head-on situation. So we have to use speed. So speed of five versus two. 3 minus 1 for disrupted is 2. Um, so here we go. We're going to resolve this combat. And we'll go ahead and we'll roll for the, for the Americans first again. Uh, we need a big roll here. Hmm, well, that's okay. Alright, so we got 4, 5, 6, 7. And this is a head-on combat, so that's minus two to the roll. That seems really bad, but we bounced, so that kind of makes it a little less worse, so plus one, so it's actually just a net minus one. So that goes down to a six. Okay, so we roll a six, so we're still on a plus three. So that is one hit. So we have one hit on the bombers. Let's go ahead and modify our roll for losses check. Now, notice that this bomber has a protection rating of 4, 5, H. And that H means they're vulnerable to head on. So, I'm going to get a plus 1 to firepower because this is a head on combat and the target has a protection H. So, they're vulnerable to head on combats. So we're going to roll 1d6, we're going to add 1 for the firepower of the P40, but plus 1 to the firepower because of this H, and we're attacking head-on. So we're going to get plus 2 to this roll. 
That's going to help us overcome that big protection rating. Aha. Okay, so 5 plus 2 is 7. That's higher than the protection rating, so that is another kill. It's nice when things work out the way you want them to. All right. So that's another kill on the bombers. Let's go ahead and roll for the Japanese on the minus three column. They roll a five. I won't even show you the modifiers. That's a miss. Minus two for head on and minus one because they're bounced. No hits for them. Now cohesion. Here we go. This could be the end for the American fighter. Let's go ahead and roll their cohesion for the American B-40s. And that's bad. Okay. So four plus one because they're on the attacking side, but minus one because they are marked with a low ammo marker. So it's a four. Four is one level of disruption. They are a flight, not a squadron, so they break after one level of disruption. So there we have it. And we can go ahead and roll the Japanese cohesion even though it's not gonna matter, but let's just go ahead and do it for kicks. Yeah, 11 minus two for two losses. No disruption for them. Okay, so here we have it. This is the end of the scenario. The Americans are going to fly home, and they are going to come back and tell some tall tales about shooting down a bunch of Japanese bombers, but they only shot down two. So, <laughs> that's how it goes. All right, let's go ahead and see how we come up with the victory conditions. So, all right, at the game and total each side's victory points for losses. Oh, for losses only. Okay, I failed to see that earlier. Um, all right, so for losses only, we're not we're not going to give them the plus six uh, victory points that a bomber typically gets for dropping its bombs because this is a, this kind of has modified victory conditions. So Americans shot down. Two, or I should say the Chinese shot down two bombers. Each of those bombers is worth two victory points. So that means the Americans have four victory points total. But if we look down here, uh, in addition, the Chinese score four VPs for each KI-21 squadron that is broken before reaching column H when they drop their bombs, or two VPs if the squadron is disrupted. So we actually disrupted that W squadron before it reached column H. So that's another two victory points. So we scored four victory points for air kills, two for each bomber, and then two more victory points for disrupting them before they reach column H. So that's six victory points total. The Japanese score zero victory points for air kills. They did not shoot down any of the P-40s. So that's a net, so subtract the Japanese VPs from the Chinese VPs to see who wins. So Japanese had zero, Chinese had six. Six minus zero is positive six. It's a draw. Ah, oh, that's a that's too bad. We were so close. If uh, if Squadron C could have uh, either disrupted these guys or scored a loss, that would have been a victory for the Chinese. So there you have it. That is scenario one. Uh, fairly easy to meet those victory conditions, and it's a good scenario to kind of learn the basics for movement, tally, combat, and there's no opposing fighters to uh, add some complexity. But scenario two, uh, we kind of have a similar situation with these bombers against these P-40s, but we're gonna add in some Japanese, some Japanese fighters. And so this is going to make things a little more interesting. Um, but before I end this video, I did want to address one comment um, from the comment to the last video I posted, and that was by uh, Evil Dr. Ganymede. Um, he uh, made mention of something that happened in turn two, I believe, um, about me doing some metagaming. And I'm not, <laughs> I'm kind of new, I'm not very familiar with the term metagaming, but I think what he's talking about is kind of. Uh, being gamey or using tactics that don't seem fitting for what this game represents. And so I'll kind of try to rep uh, reset up what he's talking about. We had the bombers flying in and the P-40s were flying up. 
towards the bombers, and I'm not going to worry about setting it up exactly, but essentially C had a vector up here somewhere, and he was down here, and he had to move. So I had him climb uh, one, two movement points to climb here, and he had one more movement point. But since he satisfied the, uh, the requirements for moving closer to his vector and climbing one elevation, he doesn't have to spend that third movement point flying closer. He can actually stay put. And I had him circle and spend his last movement point here, and as part of that circling, I just kind of changed his facing to face this way so that, um, well, it didn't really make a difference here because my tally opportunities, I could only tally X. But let's just say, for example, for example, let's say his tally was over here and I had this guy climb up here, and he still doesn't have a tally, right, because his vector's on the map. So he climbs up here for two movement points, he's got one more movement point, and he's in a pickle, because next tally phase, all the enemy squadrons are behind him. They're in, well, actually, since he's rotated like this, all of these squares are behind him. He's gonna get a minus two to his tally roll. That's really bad, so I, I, I had him flip his facing for his final movement point to face this way to avoid that or, or I mean I guess I could have just had him face straight up like this okay um, to have him so that these squares are not behind him just trying to avoid that minus two uh, tally modifier now did I cheat did I and, and the term well it's not cheating it's not the question that evil Dr. Ganymede was was bringing up was I metagaming was I doing something unrealistic right because they're moving towards their vector so you would think that their focus and their attention is in this direction and they're missing the bombers yeah and you can play that way and that's totally right um, if you uh, and I guess it comes down to your style of play if you like to go for well if I were these pilots I wouldn't be thinking about behind me because my vector is still in front of me um, and so this may seem a little gamey. It's not cheating. It is using the rules legitimately. I can go ahead and change my facing like that for my last movement point to set up a better tally opportunity. But some people may say, eh, I don't think that, you know, that seems like it's bending the rules in the direction they weren't supposed to go. Well, I don't think so. I like to explore the, the rules uh, and see what kind of strategy choices are available to the player. And this is a valid strategy choice. Having satisfied my climb and move closer requirements, I'm spending my last movement point to face this way. Now, can I justify this in game terms? Well, maybe, and uh, for the way my mind works, I'm gonna say these pilots are getting closer to their vector, they know the bomber's around here somewhere, and remember, I, it's good to think of facing as not just the direction the aircraft are facing, but where their attention is. So they could still be flying this way, but their attention is kind of looking behind them. The pilots are getting an easy, did we miss the bombers? We're almost to our vector. Are they behind us? Did we miss them? And so maybe they're still flying in this direction, but they're facing, their uh, their direction is looking behind them like, eh, you know, what did we, did we miss them? Um, we're getting kind of close, so we're not sure of where they are. So I think this is a perfectly legitimate and non-metagaming move. Um, and it, to me, I can make sense of it by using my elaborate explanation there. So yeah, maybe I am just <laughs> over explaining it in my head to not feel guilty about this. I say that, I say that uh, just silly. I'm not being serious. It's a game. Uh, play it the way you want to. And if you want to play uh, in a way that makes sense historically to your own hurt, um, do so. If you want to use the rules, um, to allow yourself a better strategy choice, do that. I think that brings out the the strategy and depth of this game, uh, the choices that are available to you as a player. So, but yeah, that was the concern. Did I metagame there by having him use his freedom of last movement point to change his facing to get a better view of those bombers in the next tally phase? Um, and there's lots of other things like this. I should, maybe I should do a video just on that because there are some things that you can do that may seem thematically inaccurate. 
and in particular how you use your tallies all right I mean if you have a tally on X you have free movement you can fly anywhere and so and I've used this tactic quite a lot where let's say I'm up here around this bomber and I have a tally on this bomber but I really want to attack this unit way down here you know or something like that something goofy um, and so let's just say it's the movement phase this guy moves he has a tally on him so he moves next but you know I have a tally on him but I really want to tally this guy next turn so rather than move towards this guy okay my video paused there with a notification my phone popped up so sorry about that so jumping right back in here um, <laughs> if this bomber moves to and then this guy has a tally on him he wants to um, he wants to move um, towards this guy you can use his his tally on this guy to fly one two three four and get closer to this guy I know his tallys over here but he's using his free movement from the tally on W to fly down here so that next movement phase or next tally phase he can possibly he'll drop his tally on this guy and try to tally that guy that's perfectly legal uh, per the rules you don't have to fly or you know stick around where your tally is um, and again some people may say that's metagaming that that's not realistic and well maybe not um, but it is allowed per the rules and uh, again can you justify it well I think I can I can say you know these guys these pilots are aware of enemy presence and they see these guys they don't see these guys but they know they're in the vicinity and so now they have a frame of reference oh the bombers we must be hitting the high ones let's fly down now because we, we, we know roughly where these guys are the other enemy maybe we want to get down lower because maybe there's more down there and so they're using their tally on these guys as a frame of reference to fly down lower um, did that happen in the war I don't know <laughs> I'm not I'm not an expert in uh, or have studied much uh, World War II tactics uh, any aer aerial combat for that matter I, I just enjoy the game I enjoy history so I kind of dabble in it but um, to me this makes I can make perfect sense of it that you know they're using their tally on an undesirable target to move into a position where they believe more enemies are that they want to tally and in particular, you'll see this happen a lot with, with fighters, right? You'll have a broken fighter that the enemy is fleeing with, and you're using your tally on him just to reposition yourself where the unbroken enemy are. And I think that's perfectly legitimate. And if you don't want to play that way, then don't play that way. Um, but if you want to use the um, options available to you in the game uh, to em employ a better strategy, then I think this is a best use of the tally rules and use that free movement because free movement is powerful without a tally you're in hard straights for interceptors they just have to circle or go home without a tally or without a vector um, and so you want tallies as soon as possible not just to engage the enemy but to position yourself where you really want to be so use those free movement opportunities when you can Okay, <clears throat> well, I'll go ahead and wrap up this video here, and next time, maybe, we'll delve into Scenario 2, Birthday Present. But um, go ahead and put in the comments if you want to see something different, uh, give, me a, give me a suggestion. We can continue with the scenarios if you want to see combat examples or um, examples of a different mechanic in the game. Uh, fleshed out some more uh, let me know I'll try to give you the content you want to see um, but also put up the content that I'd like to see out there so all right well thanks for watching and have a good one